<laughs> I do nothing, literally, all the time. <laughs> all right, so my name is Edgar Alon. I work with CBS. Um, and my talk is The Cloud is Broken, um, which, of course, is uh, just, you know, sort of get people here. Uh, it's not really broken. Broken, it works fine. All right, so uh, let me just say I work for PBS, but these are not PBS opinions. My opinions. Uh, and I'm not yet omniscient, so there's probably inaccuracies here, and I welcome audience participation. So, so what we're really talking about is not the cloud as a, as a function, but cloud orchestration. Right? And so I'm not going to justify that I'm speaking at DC Python about cloud orchestration. Just you know, just go with, yeah, we have to deploy somewhere. The cloud is a good place as any. Um, and I'm also talking about moderate to complex environments, so like my blog. Doesn't count. It's just HTML, S3 bucket. That's not really interesting. So we're talking about like more complex apps. In fact, let's talk. Let's just pick an app here, right? Okay. So uh, I need a moderately complex architecture. So we have a web tier. That's great. And we check out from from Git, and that, that runs the code. Of course, it's Python. Then we have a, uh, a a database master with slaves, and uh, we. Manage that using using our DDL tools and uh, migrations. Uh, I mean, we have a memcacher, Redis server to speed things up. Pretty cool. Uh, and we have some sort of task, background tasks, so we can accuse things with tasks. Okay, so great. You, know, you look at that, and you're like, yeah, I can, it's no problem. I, I got that, right? Uh, but then when you actually need to deploy, you have to think about more things, right? Okay, so the app tier, it's in an auto scaling group, so like if I get a lot of load, it has to go up, and then they down and then probably need some sort of firewall. Like I guess I don't need the exposed 423. Um, the, the database master has has slaves, so I have to figure out replication, and that has network implications. And memcache is just wide open; and it doesn't care at all who connects to it, so it need, definitely needs to be locked down. Um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. The worker processes the whole pool doesn't need any inbound access. Just so like, oh crap, all this stuff, I, I, I can't really, this doesn't go in my Git repository. Like, you know, where does this stuff go? Uh, even worse, you evolve, right? And so your CEO comes, hey, you know, we need fast searches. And it's going to be awesome, full text search. OK, well, we're on version one now. We'll, we'll get to version two, but we'll start working on it. So let's add Elasticsearch as a new server there. And then he hears about big data at some conference. And he's like, OK, we need to do like crunch numbers and stuff, right? So now you have sort of evolution of your architecture. Like, you know, last year it was just those, that first slide. Now there's like more stuff that, that keeps happening. And not only that, you have, you know, multiple environments. I have a production environment, then I have a, a staging environment that I can work with my stakeholders and check everything out. And then QA has to test new stuff that I'm checking in, and all those devs, they want their own personal environment. Otherwise, they're just saying it works on my laptop, and let's ship it to production. And you're like, OK, let's do some more testing. <laughs> no one's done that, right? So you end up with a situation where you're like, well, OK, I got V1 of the architecture on production. So my last search is in QA. And you know, devs are working in V3, and then a production bug comes in, and then we get back to V1 so I can develop against it and test it before it goes to production. If maybe not. Maybe we just hop back to production. That's fine. So, wow. That's like, when you add the layers, like we have these great tools, you know, version control software and, and, and you know, um, other tools we'll get into, but this is a lot of stuff. So, excuse me. Yes. What, what do you mean by the Version, version of the architecture, oh, right? So like, take your whole project, your whole app that you sell or, or support or do whatever, okay. it evolves over time. So like, it, just, just to illustrate, you, you, know, you, you have code that has drivers for Elasticsearch. You have a haystack or something in, in V2. And so when you, you can stand up an Elasticsearch server in, in QA, but maybe you know, flip back and forth. So you, you want to you know what? have in each of these environments, right? And you have to manage them appropriately. And it becomes a philosophy shift. So back in the olden days, you know, like five years ago, we 
we had real hardware. <laughs> you know, and, and what you did was you, you racked things and you plugged it in, and then you took your piece of paper and you wrote down where you plugged everything in. Then you went back to your desk and you got Visio and you drew it all out and you, and you, and you posted it up on, on the walls and said, don't touch anything unless you change this, right? That was how you did change management. You, hopefully, maybe, maybe not. There are some versions of that, maybe a little more formal. Uh, now we have these cool, you know, cloud services that, that you know, I can put an agent on, and whether I have Datadog or Splunk or, or all these other things that say, oh, we, we'll, we'll track everything for you, and we'll tell you where everything is. That sort of works. I mean, it works really well for what's on the box and what the box is doing, but maybe not for my load balancer. You know, I'm just tracking that. So we end up with this idea, and I'm sure you guys have seen the um, you know, Hacker News, everything on infrastructure as code, right? Or uh, 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 infrastructure as a service. And the philosophy is, and I'm sure you guys have it, but I'm, I'm going to tell you guys again what it is. You start with the idea. You start with what you want, and you make the tools instantiate that in, in real life not real life, but in virtual life, so that you don't start with your server first and then back up to documentation. You start with documentation and you proceed to your environment and your whole holistic infrastructure. Another tenet of the really hardcore infrastructure's code folks is that once you actually instantiate from your desire what you want, never touch it, like it's immutable. You can't change it at all. Otherwise, the whole plot, you're deviating from the philosophy. So you can't even SSH into this thing. That everything has to be driven, kind of like uh, you write software in C or, or whatever, some compiled language, and you compile it, and then you go and start editing the binary code. That's sort of the philosophy they're talking about. Like, don't do that, you start with your code, Compile, 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 get a binary, run that. And it's the same sort of thing. And so the really hardcore guys are like, if, if you do anything in the cloud by hand, <laughs> it's like going, it's like, oh, yeah, I needed that. I needed the function. I just had a station the server six months ago, wrote a Perl script to, to move files around, didn't tell anyone about it, didn't check it in the source code. It's, you know, I cut and paste blocks of code in here. That's sort of the philosophy. It's like they should get rid of SSH mm -hmm. on these servers. Just block 422 across the board. And if you need to recreate this, you do it from the beginning. You just go whoosh, all the way through. Okay? So this is a great idea. And I read this. And I'm like, oh, this, I love this. Let's do it. You know. And I start looking out there at all these tools that are out there. It's interesting. What I found was we've learned a lot from software development, you know, compiling code, doing all this stuff, right? Not a lot of these cloud orchestration tools that are available today embrace these same philosophies. Okay? A lot of them are like they do a couple things. And you know, some other ones do things over here, but Nothing really looks at holistically how, if we really want to treat our infrastructure as code, we should do what we learned, which is everything we've done with, well, not everything we've done, but here are the highlights, right? Sure, we can argue about all kinds of low-level, deep software development abstractions and philosophies, but here are the big ones, right? And you guys should re recognize every one of these things as Tenants that are ingrained in you from the, either the first year of computer science or your first day at your software programming job. You know, hopefully you're a good mentor telling you, saying, hey, you know what? That function or that code that you just cut and paste six times, you should really make a function. All right, so let's let's walk through these real quick. Um, all right, so modules and decomposition. We know from software that we should probably like organize things properly. 
And that means I'm going to group functions into a single file that makes sense together or class. But it also means that my whole project, my whole software project, my whole Python project is one Git repo and not 20 Git repos. Right? I'm not versioning, actually I am versioning each individual file, but I you do it collectively, right? So I check in like 10 files at a time. And GitHub says that's that's one change set. So, you know, what kills me is I log into Chef and it says, great, here's all your servers. You can change each one. I'm going to remember the change of each server. And I'm like, great, but what about the changes I did to my database server and my web server at the same time? And what I found is oh, there's, there's, it's, it's difficult to really find these. They're getting it. They're starting to figure it out that, okay, I need to sort of collect things together and not just when I log in, give me a list of all my yeah, EC2 instances, which do me no good. So um, we're getting there, but right now it's, it's kind of crappy. Uh, same thing with versioning, right? Okay, so, you know, versioning is very important and we don't do it. We we don't version each file as a repo. We take the whole thing as a repo. And um, this is even worse support, right? And so, like, uh, they have great support for, like, versioning scripts, individual scripts. Like, hey, I, this, I have a script for installing Apache on EC2. Oh, great. And you can version it, like, to 30 different revisions, right? But you're not looking holistically at the whole system. You're not saying, I version this, and then you want to apply this, and then you want to apply this, because it all works together. So, also, pretty crappy. So, yeah, this whole presentation is just me complaining. So. <laughs> um, all right, code reuse. You know, this has really been beaten into us um, as Pythonistas. We're really, you know, rabid about code reuse, honestly, compared to some other languages. So that's great. Uh, and we have some of this. You know, I can extract some things out of these, these scripts. So um, oftentimes, when I look at Ansible or Chef or Puppet, I can have these global variables that I can pull out and then apply when I'm doing environments. So actually, I'm going to say this is not bad. Right? You know, it could be better. It could be more formalized. It could be better than me having one giant bucket of global variables from my entire system. But I'll take it, right? You know, I'll take whatever I can get. Ideally, it would be if I could group my project within Chef Ransomable and then have global uh, variables within that and then global variables for, for different environments. But you know what? It's, it's, I'm not going to argue this one because every day they're adding more stuff and they can probably actually do this. I just don't know. Okay. Uh, abstraction is interesting, right? Like, uh, POSIX was a great thing, and we don't have to write for all kinds of different Unix systems. I can just do a file I/O sort of thing. Uh, that's one example, but you know, there's there's tons of other examples that we use, uh, even at the higher levels like Haystack and so on and so forth, to, to abstract stuff out. So why don't I do that from my uh, cloud environments, right? Why don't I look at can I do, use AWS, and Rackspace, and and Linode, and all these other different uh, cloud hosting providers as generic tools, right? And actually, we're making progress on here, so OpenStack is fighting that fight vigorously, and I think they're actually getting a lot of traction, so I'm, I'm really pretty happy about this one because now I can have a load balancer deployed in different places and, and it will just work without me worrying about how the load balancer works or, or what are the idiosyncrasies for this particular All right, so compilation workflow. Uh, it's important to have rigorous steps from my source code to uh, some sort of compiler or build version or, or egg or, or whatnot. And, and that really helps to, having a workflow that's rigorous and done by computers instead of humans helps me get repeatable results. And uh, we have varying different levels. A lot of these 
systems like Chef and Ansible are really very good at getting your server to a certain state. Like, that's what they do well. But what about my database? What about my auto scaling group? What about my firewalls? You know, sure they say, well, you can just write your own custom Python code that is you know, 2,000 lines long. And I'm like, okay, why am I using your tool at this point? But um, you know, it's a mixed bag. Okay. Take it. All right. So this is my next slide. Is my uh, uh, the, the old lady who swallowed a fly <laughs> sort of thing? Because it is <laughs> really it all rolls up, right? And so there's way too much text on the slide. I know you guys are reading it, but like it really says, okay. First, I need to have generic entities in the cloud. And then I need to manage those generic entities into groups. And then I need to version those groups so that as it changes over time, I can figure it out. And then I need to be able to pull out certain variables so that each time I stamp it on a new environment, QA, production, developer, I can put different variables in. But as said, the essence of your project is the same, right? There's still a web tier. There's still a database. It just maybe not as big as powerful as production, but it still functions the same way. And then finally, I need a whole workflow to do all this so I don't do it by hand. So, you know, this is like, you know, by this, she swallowed the cow. She's dead. And the problem is, I don't really, I mean, we need to get to this point, and we're not there yet. But this is where I think the whole orchestration would So, all right, I painted a pretty miserable picture here. <laughs> like, what do we do? Well, we don't do anything. Or we, we either jump into the fray and start pushing these organizations that are running these open source projects or actually contributing to the open source projects to look at the whole system holistically. And I, I don't really know why they're not looking at it holistically. Maybe because they're all started by sysadmins who like just want to get stuff done and stop being called or whatever. But we're software developers and we should take this from our software perspective forward into the infrastructure perspective. So instead of them, the, my sysadmins, and I mean that in a loving sense, I love those guys, they you know push up and help us automate our software, we should go down the other way and say, you know what? I know a thing or two about making stuff work, so let's push down into the infrastructure as, as it comes. So there's some, there's some hope, right? So uh, two interesting, very interesting projects. They're they're sort of like the the, the shining star is the open source solution. And there's a couple other ones like um, well I don't know they're, they're all commercial visual ops and some other ones. And you know right scale used to be in there, but they they're not keeping up with some of these philosophies and whatnot. So you know check these out if you want. Um, I don't know if there's other ones there. I mean, I hope, you know, eventually you, you look at one of the big guys like Chef or Ansible and say, oh, hey, you know, all I have to do is extend, uh, you know, we have a really good server state management tool. Now we can do, because that's hard. That's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and, and they've done it. They totally nailed it. But it's, it's beyond that. We have to look at the whole array of infrastructure. We have to look at defining our, our networks, offer to find networks. And, uh, and interaction between these things, as well as concepts like this is an auto scaling group, and this is a load balancer that I have that, that can expand and change, and so on and so forth. So um, there might be others. I mean, I you know I spend probably half a day, every quarter, maybe a whole day, every two weeks. But anyways, uh, and, I, and I just search for like what's new because this is a really interesting like area of, of cloud orchestration. Like like people are adding this stuff all the time. And I think if we, you know, sort of just put these, crystallize our thoughts in terms of what's important to us, then eventually they'll say, okay, yeah, we'll get it. And, you know, in five years, maybe three years, all this, you know, you know pointing one of these and be like, oh, yeah, that does all this stuff. And it's awesome. It's beautiful. I, I press one button, right? And, and this frustration came out of my perspective. It's like, okay, you know, I... Our group starts growing. We start developing more projects, more projects, and I want to. There's a bug in one of the projects, and the developer isn't available on vacation. Okay, 
why, why is there one button saying, all right, I'm checking in code because I know exactly where the fix is, but, oh, geez, I don't know how to deploy this thing. There's all kinds of goofy you know, scripts and whatnot in versioning, so I don't want to screw up that stuff. Plus, I don't even know what's in production, you know? So that's sort of the, the genesis of the presentation. I think that's it. Yeah, we're hard. So a lot of you guys are actually work in the cloud field or the infrastructure field. So, so how come you just ignore Docker? Well, okay, let's talk about Docker. Docker is really interesting technology for containerization of a Linux box. So you can, it's like you can, it brings the versioning to the, the system administration and also make pretty much virtual networks and just networking containers. And it solves a lot of these problems that you're talking about. It, it, it does, and, and, and so the the level of Docker that I, I see is like, okay, it has, I can create virtual instances, great. EC2, I could do that like eight, eight years ago, and, and that's that's fine. It's a lot faster, and it's cool, and less resources, well, so I guess I gotta do it. But then, then I connect different things, right? And it's more of, I'm describing the apps that connect to each other versus really defining, defining like a software defined network. And that's, maybe it's good enough, right? But can I really, um, you know, instrument up or, or define a, a virtual entity like, I'm trying to think of, of something, like an auto scaling group. Is, do I have that idea in, in Docker? And can, if I can test that, right? So that's sort of an in, interesting and important part of my app. If I can't auto scale, you know, it has to be able to come back down, and I probably could do that, you know, not, especially with OpenStack, right? You can all that software base, you can do that in there. Um, it's a lot of work, right? And we could do it, but there's no inherent versioning of the whole thing. I have to write my own, right? Of, of all this, these Docker scripts. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's getting closer, but it's not out of the box. It's not one of those things where like I can press a button. And, your implementation and, and Brian's implementation, Jason's implementation would be totally different because we're writing a lot of this blue logic ourselves. But there's no obvious one way to do it. Correct. Mm -hmm. But I love Docker. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it's nice, right? It's fast. But I can sort of do the same thing with EC2 now. I can write all this stuff myself. But I'm not that smart. I mean, it would be wrong. So. Uh, do you, you know a lot about Docker or work with a lot? So I recently had had uh, a use for. Even though I'm not in the I'm not in this enterprise yeah. level of stuff, but so how is you know we looked at I, I think I'm sorry, but I think the most important use of Docker is portability. That's the killer use of Docker, and, and it blows away even this virtual machine stuff. It's just extremely impressive. Right now. So, yeah, we, we looked at we looked at very closely at Docker um, <clears throat> as a ways to go before it's like super production ready for enterprises. The networking layer that they use inside these virtual interfaces has some work to go. Um, a lot of the tying applications together using like host names is sort of hinky, and then you sort of use text stuff that like gets imported into the Docker container. Mm -hmm. It creates a host file. It does some things yeah. that um, makes it challenging for debugging when things go oh, yeah. funky. Yeah. Um, it's really cool stuff, uh, but you know we we looked at it uh, for our own stuff and. It's getting there, and it does solve that like awesome portability piece of like, yeah. Look, Python eggs suck, and I can't like I want dependencies, and I can't just get, just okay, great, thank you. Put it in a Docker container and send it out. But we what we ran into right away was what you were talking about is that you got now you have the application, and the application in Docker is like oh don't worry about the infrastructure, you just mm -hmm. do it defined inside the Docker container. But then to your point, you're like well security groups and load balancers and all these things that come together and. The software-defined networking in Docker is not quite good enough to solve those problems yet. Um, it, although, yeah, may get there. Yeah. Software-defined networking is really you could, hard. You could argue the same thing. I have, you know, take AWS CloudFormation. If you're not familiar with the AWS environment, CloudFormation is a way to take dry a JSON file that does everything, automates everything you could possibly do in Amazon, and that's like great. Those are all the, the tiny little building blocks that could be the nugget for starting these things, right? Build upon that, but you know it's it's like miles away from sort of the stuff I'm talking about in terms of okay we need to do a formal sort of thing. Um, like the pieces 
that are actually there. I mean, I think that that's the thing is that yeah. most of these pieces yeah. are there, and Docker is right. definitely one of the pieces that we'll be using like in the future. Right. But it's not even though the pieces are there, nobody's built this actual orchestration. Right. Like I sure as hell don't just want a QA staging in production. I also want to fire up this other version because of that particular problem, like where you've got a production bug and your QA and your staging are working on these fairly catastrophic infrastructure changes that are going to be moving along. And you can't throw Docker into the mix and say that's going to solve the problem. That's just missing the point, kind of, if that makes sense. So like the other, like the problem is that you all of a sudden need to fire up this infrastructure and you should just be able to just grab something and boom, do it. But you can't. And so it's like painstaking to like pull that out and fire up this other environment pseudo staging because you had to do this production hot fix. You know? Like that's the that's the problem that we really run into like almost all the time. Um, it just slows us down. So sometimes we don't do that production hot fix. Or the production hot fix happens with an SSH instead of like a Dockerization, right? Right. So yeah, the orchestration exactly. so that's like the what we want is we want to be building straight out to Dockers. But because the orchestration hasn't been built around it yet. I mean, from the first moment, like you said, all the tools are there. The first moment I could actually create a virtual machine in anything, or a Docker virtual machine, and also do a software-defined network, that, that has unlocked this capability, so why, why are we not there yet, right? Like, this is, you know, okay, we can do this stuff. I can control my, my, my world, my virtual world, you know, the, based in software. So why haven't I gone through this, you know, the steps here? And I think it's because oftentimes we're busy, we're like, okay, we need a production environment. Great. We can just fire up Ubuntu, install Apache, install Python, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that was great. That's production. Check the box, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and then you go into the QA when the QA is actually claim they need to test things before you ship. And then, you know, and then you're like, well, like, a little different here, a little different there, but they're like these, you know, handcrafted Fabergé eggs that you sort of hand, like, they should be, they should be disposable, they should not mm -hmm. throw it away. You know, oh, we need a new version, oh, the heart bleed more, really great. Just change my source, recompile, right? And that's really the analogy that, that, that resonates with me anyway. It's like, this is, you know, some sort of C code or something that I just compile into a binary, and that's what actually runs all my stuff. And I'm, ne I'm never editing that. That. So one way we've avoided this is following more of the Heroku philosophy, <coughs> which is we don't own the infrastructure. There's a there's an API. It's it's it's, it, it's constraining, right? It says your app should behave a certain way, but if it does, you push the repo to it, and and, and then there's the layering of config, which is managed in a database, not necessarily in a in a repository itself, which maybe it could be improved. But uh, I see some parts of the Heroku philosophy, you know, get you know, a long way there, and and we've modeled that in our system, which we've open sourced as a product called Velociraptor, but it, it it leverages not Docker but the LXC underneath Docker because Docker asks for too much, yeah. too, too much control for it. Uh, but that, yeah, we're still not anywhere where you're saying we we, we stop at the low load balancer. We say. You give us a load balancer as a service out there, and we will administer those. Yeah. But we will include that as part of your metadata yeah. into the apps yeah. in different environments. And the Heroku model is very, for those who don't know, they just say, just give us your code, and we'll take care of all this web server and stuff and database and stuff. You just drop the code in and, and actually check it in the repo, and it pulls down, and it will auto scale, it will need, you'll do what it needs to do, it'll do firewall protection automatically, and it's a very cool. Sort of deployment in a controlled environment, and, and and I like that. I think it removes a lot of variables. And I guess I'm sort of looking for the general case, but you know, maybe I'm like tilting it. Well, I mean, we don't use Heroku. We wrote our own because we didn't want to pay Heroku, you know, premium for using Amazon. Right. 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 And 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 you you're you're constrained with that model. So you have to mm. do someone else that as a platform as a service versus infrastructure as a service, right? right? So yeah, but that's. There's more and more out there.
gotten somewhat close. Um, I completely agree with everything that you've said. Um, uh, if you start looking at the cloud formation thing down, though, or, at, or building up, depending upon how you're looking at it, so uh, your fear of, hey, does this security group that we've got here match this security group, and I need these two to talk. Of course, there's no layer to do that, but there's nothing preventing us from necessarily doing that, other than having to write code ourselves to do that sort of thing. Um, depending upon the architecture of the system as a whole, so we've been spending a lot of time looking at the open source, how to do all of these cloud things by itself, native. Um, the two big ones are the Netflix tool stack and the Twitter tool stack. And so then you have to start worrying about other things. But it actually takes some of your worries away from you. Because, for instance, your load balancer, client-side load balancing for everything. You have a service registry that holds a repository that says, hey, you've got this service, service A. Here are the 18 instances of service A running. Service B that needs to call service A gets that list and uses client-side load balancing to say, I can hit any one of these. It can also then um, inform itself repeatedly to say, oh, number two was down, so I'm not going to hit number two for another couple minutes. I'm going to go back to number three or number one or any type of load balancing, client-side load balancing algorithm you want to use. Um, the comment that was made over here, how do you do all these different versions? Um, uh, the Twitter stack has a convention that they call delegation tables. <coughs> which is a header that gets sent along the request route. So let's say you've got a web server up front, then you're hitting three other services down the road. Okay. Um, as long as you change that header up top, those three other services, you can say, OK, I want to point to this one. But these, the context gets passed along with every request. So if I say I want to change, you've got one, two, three sitting behind it. I say I want to change two to four. It can go to one. One says I need to call two, but it automatically changes and distributes back to th to four. And then four says I need to call three, and then that proceeds as normal. So you can actually change the graph dynamically at runtime, which is a fascinating concept because then you get rid of some of those problems where what do I do? How do I stack up all of these versions? How am I as a developer? How do I get my own code in there? Well, you just launch your own service or any number of services, rewrite those couple headers according to just you know a couple of string replacement uh, statements, basically. And then you have that graph in any way, shape, form that you kind of want. Um, for versioning, that's a very interesting one, too, um, in that the way that I've been doing it personally, and I just kind of fell into this, um, we use some Ansible to do a, a lot of this stuff because, like you said, it covers all the server management that I would never need. It does it and does it well. Um, but it doesn't cover handling multiple, multiple things together. So I've kind of tried to divide that along the lines of, OK, well, I'm going to have multiple repositories for all of these different things. Now, I know I don't like that. That, that I don't love, to be honest. <laughs> However, if you do it that way, there's nothing preventing you from abstracting out configuration files, making them a Git submodule or whatever it's going to be. You want to take this thing and deploy it to a new subnet or a new VPC or whatever it's going to be, you take what could be a submodule for every one of these repositories. You say, I want to change that submodule now. Of course, that's nasty as well. But at that point, you should be able to redeploy from this VPC to this other VPC without any problems. And then that gives the developers any instance they want. That gives QA any instance that they want. That gives production any instance that they want. The thing that you're missing here, um, which I would also love, is rolling deploys. That's freaking hard. That's <clears throat> That needs to be much better. That's just way too hard. Well, we've gotten away from rolling deploys <coughs> and use routing so that we have, I mean, it's the Heroku model, yep. right? It, you stand up your new instances, switch the routes so that they all go instantaneously. We found mm -hmm. that to be less painful than rolling deploys, where sure. you might have some apps that are responding in a particular 
form and another one's not quite yet. And so you have to account for that when you think about your software. What happens if this, pe if this node is running a newer version than the older node mm -hmm. in, in, a si in, in the same pool of requests that's yep. serving your clients? It's really interesting. It's like you guys are describing, you know, uh, excellent sort of, I'm drilling down. This is my, this is my major pain point, so I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to use a tool to do it. And there are two, every, like the same thing with Docker. You know, pick any one of these. There's a great tool out there that does exactly what you need. Yeah, or, or usually <laughs> two thirds of exactly what I right, need. Or, you know, you're lucky you get one tool that does exactly what you need. But yep. then you're like, oh shit, there's all this other stuff that I need to do. I'm gonna, I end up using like six, 16 different tools. Absolutely. None of them talk to each other. So. In that regard, isn't it similar to programming? Like to get back to your theme of like we're bringing to infrastructure what we have in programming. I mean, a lot of the reusability of code. Isn't it the case that often the pieces of reusable code that we want to use get us most of the way there, but not all the way there? Like, like, yeah. is it? Is, I, I don't know. And, like, and, then, and then you know, you, you, you know, like you use the compiler like against the 32-bit versus 64-bit, and then oh, I need two versions of that now. But I, I guess my yeah. point is like, it's not perfect in the programming world either, right? So correct, like correct, but. There are tools that at least recognize that you know these are challenges. As as practitioners of this computer science discipline, we have a, we have embraced and you can talk to anyone, no one except for the maybe the first year college student who says, I don't want to version stuff. It's gonna be like you can absolutely have the version, otherwise you're crazy. Yeah. Whereas you now get in the cloud and I talk to these vendors, I'm like, great, so you, I put together this nice diagram for my app. I'm like, okay, well, what if I want to change it? They're like, oh, just export it and check that in. So you're not, you're not saying it needs to be perfect. You're just I'm saying just saying they, they don't even recognize that it's a need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what makes me the saddest yeah, part. It's like, okay, yeah. but all of you guys, are, you know, yeah, which absolutely, have, have felt the pain doing software development without these these support of these things. And you know, the ops guys have just known no other. Way of life than pain. <laughs> it's perfectly normal to them. We're like, we can make this better. For all this, we should be in the opposite awesome world. Yeah. But that, that's a form of pain, I guess. Right? Right. <laughs> it could be right. better. It's like a certain type of person. Um, so, wait, so yeah. go back to your statement about what's the approach. So, how do we, how, how do we fix this? Right. We build on these these tenets of the software development, and, and, and what I've written here is a bullet item of a of a concrete instantiation or, or implementation of, of the philosophy. And just as Eddie's pointing out, there's there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Like I don't, you know, you know, versioning and, and, and do, don't repeat yourself workflow can be done sixteen different ways. And here's just one, right? Like I just want to be able to have this and, and you know maybe you know Ansible does you know the, the second one here and this third one here but I have to do manual steps here or write glue logic to do that one and I don't care about extraction because my I just you know I just use AWS so I don't care about that one but I'm talking about the general case here you know so we can get by I mean we're all doing our jobs right if we're getting software shipped and stuff is working but it, it could be better and, and the, the thing about it is, like, we don't have to write anything from, from the ground. Like, I don't want to have to rewrite what Ansible does for me. I mean, it does a really good job with this stuff. Um, but I just need to use it in a smart way. And there's actually very cool tools uh, coming out that, like, um, uh, HashiCorp, the guys from Vagrant, mm -hmm. they just released uh, Terraform and, well, not just, but like two months ago. Uh, Terraform is a uh, cloud orchestration tool, low level, to do stuff. Uh, and then there's um, Atlas, which I had high hopes for. Okay, great, this is, this is going to do it. But it, it's getting there, but it's not quite there. Right? Same thing with Docker, like Swarm. They have all these cool, you know, uh, big orchestration tools that come out, but they're not quite there yet. I would love it if Docker solves the problem. Because then, yeah. Do you think there's any set of things so we're talking about as engineers pushing down our philosophies into ops? Are there any rules that maybe we are ignoring that should be getting pushed up from you know these guys who have run our structure for you know, the painful way?
Yeah. Or 15 years. I mean, we go into what we see the most, which is really, really fascinating, is when we go into a customer site, first thing you look at their Amazon account, and it's a fucking rat's nest. <laughs> I mean, there is just shit everywhere. And you're just like, uh, and, it, and it really is a mechanism of quick, quick moving. And you go look at these guys who are running data centers for 10 years, you look at their sort of get up, and it is pristine. Now, part of that's because they had to hunt the shit out of it to make sure, like, house of cards, it should not fall over. But I wonder if there are some things that we're looking that we need to be going, well, there are some things coming up from the, from the ground that we should be paying attention well, to. Well, without being too stereotypical, I would now proceed to explain <laughs> stereotypes. So, like, you know, as a developer, I'm like, ah, oh, cool, Amazon just released this new feature. I'm going to, I don't care that I need it. I'm going to put it in somehow and, and, and do stuff. Whereas the, the <laughs> canonical ops guy comes in, his desk just says, clean, there's nothing there, and he wants he checks all the servers first thing he does in the morning and make everything the same and then when change requests come in from the from the dev guys he's like shit I gotta change things because I'm happy when nothing happens I'm happy when things are stable that's where I get the, the big smile on my face as an ops guy and so there's always this natural tension at least a healthy tension between these two, two, two groups right and so uh, you know the, the concept of DevOps a, a developer getting root access to your web server gives you like chills if you're an ops guy you're like oh shit they're going to take it down, or they're going to put a time bomb so that on Saturday night when I'm having my cocktails, then it's going to go down. Um, you know, and so the, where the, the tension, and, and you can say, well, what, what can make you at ease? Like, okay, well, if this is repeatable fashion, like if, if I just take what they want and I put it through the machine and it comes out and I can test it and then roll back because I created the other previous version during the same process, that makes me feel a lot better, right? It still doesn't obviate the need for security guys and ops guys to understand that you really shouldn't just open up all your ports in case you might want to tunnel through something or other. But, you know, uh, so there's a lot of disciplines. It doesn't obviate clearly the need for ops guys, but hopefully it, it makes the tension between those groups maybe a little smoother. A little smoother. The feeling that I always get is that one of the core pieces that's missing there is observability. Mm -hmm. So I write all of this code and I bury it into some, some Git repos and then I bury it even further under my CI server which is running all of these things and kind of doubling as my terrible scheduler or whatever it is, but who cares. Um, there is no observability to any of this. You have no, so if you just said, um, what was it you just said? You said, if it's repeatable, how do you know it's repeatable? Where is the actual thing that will tell an ops person, this is now a repeatable process? That, I mean, you can have all of the GitHub modules, abstraction, workflow that you want, but if somebody can't look at that thing, kind of almost like a dashboard situation, like Splunk and all the things that the DevOps people, or the ops people are specifically interested in, if you can't look at it in a second and say, here's the diagnosis, this is what it is, you got nothing there. Right? I mean, you have right. spent hours, or go find the guy right. that wrote it, and that's it. You're toast at that point. Yeah, we saw some really like Jenkins, right? Like, so autom amazing automation until it breaks, or somebody doesn't know what you've done. Mm -hmm. And like along that same, someone doesn't know what you've done thing. We, uh, when I worked at EA, we had a whole group of de developers who had ac root access to Box, to a Box, or games access or whatever of user reason, and a Box got compromised. So all of a sudden we're like. What was going on in that box when that happened? You go look and you start asking the developers, who was on that box? And they're like, well, we all were, like, around the same time. <laughs> and you're like, well, what, what were you using? <laughs> Root? Well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's this whole observability, repeatability. And, and you know, there's, there's tons, like, you know, the, the sort of the, um, the ideas I have here, these sort of scratch the surface. I mean, this you get this in CS 101, maybe. Actually, maybe. No, you don't. But okay, you should. You should get this in CS 101. But, you know, there's like advanced courses about, you know, uh, you know, testing, coverage, and, and all this other stuff. I mean, you know, forget it. I'm just trying to get these ones, right? Like, we'll get those later. Like, in three years, I'll be here again, being like, ah, we really should have test coverage and traceability. Something neat one of my groups has done is uh, they're the Windows group and they're using Octopus Deploy. And one of the things Octopus Deploy does is it deploys based on your release notes. So it parses your release notes, it looks at the version number you've written. If you haven't written release notes for a version, you can't release that version. 
That's the only way you release a version is by writing release notes, and, which causes the developers to write good release notes. So now you know they, they write you know they write the version number, they write a bit about what they've done. So now when ops comes in, deploys that, or has to roll back, they see the reason the developer created a particular release. If something's going wrong, they have reason to assess. Can we roll back? If so, which one do we roll back to? And right. so it, it provides some of that visibility. Well, at least you have comments from the developer. <laughs> Whether or not they make sense. Or yes, exactly. But yes, you can go the, back and say. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, humans are uh, great random number generators, right? And so if you allow SSH access to your system, you have just created a random uh, you know, <laughs> event, a random fork that could just destroy your whole system. You know, and, and that's sort of like, let's take that away from... Humans are great. But, you know, that's all I need. Thank you. That's it. I have a question. Um, because there's so much good conversation surrounding this topic from the audience, could we revisit this subject in like a few months just to sure. check in with people? Like put it on the yeah. board now. I, 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 like I said, I keep a running list of like, sure. okay, here's what's new and here's what's interesting. So yeah. Because I don't think I've seen this much of the engagement from the audience um, like this to this degree for a while. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. All right. Anyway. All right. Uh,